Good morning. Good to see all of your smiling faces. Thank you for being a part of our Easter service. Oh man, I love Easter. I, you know, Sundays are my favorite day of the week, and this Sunday is my favorite Sunday. So it, uh, it blesses me that you're a part of our service today, and I trust that you'll be blessed and learn things that will help you, that will, that will change your life uh, for the better. I want to uh, tell you a story. It's a really good story. Jesus was in Jericho, comes into town. There is a tax collector that is short of stature, the Bible says. His name is Zacchaeus. They wrote a song about him. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, the wee little man was he. And he climbed up in the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. So he is up there looking to see Jesus coming into town. Jesus says, come down out of that tree, uh, Zacchaeus. I'm going to your house to eat something. Now, you know, that may have made some of the people there mad because Zacchaeus didn't have a very good reputation because he was a tax collector and he charged overage for what the Romans normally charged. He was a subcontractor. And so that's how Zacchaeus made a living, and he was very rich. So Jesus came to his house. He, Zacchaeus repented for doing people wrong, said that if he had done, he gave to the poor, and he also said if he'd done anybody wrong, he would uh, repay them fourfold. So Jesus leaves Jericho, which is down by the Dead Sea. He travels up to Jerusalem, which is in the mountains. And as he comes into Jerusalem, this is not when they put the palm branches down. This is on a Thursday. He comes up into Jerusalem on Thursday. He goes to the home. He, he, turns, he turns right as he's coming in Jerusalem. Goes up to Bethany, which is the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. He's there. He meets with them. Word starts spreading that Jesus is in town. And so people come out and start gathering around, and, and the Bible says that they came to see Jesus, and they also came to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. And of course, when word got out that Jesus was in town, and people had come to see Lazarus, the Pharisees got mad. You know, there's always a party pooper in the bunch, and the, par and the Pharisees are the epitome of party poopers. So they started to plot from the, very, from the time that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. The Bible tells us that the Pharisees plotted to kill him. And they plotted to kill Lazarus also. So Jesus is out there meeting with them. He, he gets late Thursday. Then Friday he's meeting with them. Saturday's church day. And so Sunday he goes into Jerusalem. We know that Sunday. We celebrate that Sunday as Palm Sunday, or the triumphal entry. He comes into Jerusalem. He teaches on end times that we have in Matthew 24. He overturns the table of the money changers. And I have a whole teaching on that as to why he did that. Had a very good reason for doing it. He goes back out to Bethany. On the way back in the next day, they pass the fig tree that he's cursed. And that's when we get Mark 11, 22, 23, and 24. The great teaching on faith. And Jesus goes into town on Tuesday. And there, they, he is sent ahead and they have the Passover meal ready. And he partakes of the Passover meal Tuesday evening and on into Wednesday. So they sing songs. They go out. He goes out into the garden to pray. He is betrayed. The priest guard comes and arrests him. Then all through Wednesday night, he is mocked. He is sent back and forth from politician to dignitary to leader, back and forth finally arrives back with Pontius Pilate. 
Pontius Pilate decrees that I find nothing wrong with this man, but the crowd yells out to crucify him. So he has him scourged, beaten with a whip that oftentimes killed the person. It was a horrible beating. Psalm 22 tells us that the flesh was ripped off of Jesus to such a degree that he could look and stare upon his bones. It, 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 it was a terrible thing. One of the things that made it so difficult and painful for him to carry the cross is he had places on him to where there was no flesh or, or the, the muscle was torn open. He's led out that morning to a place called Golgotha. The place of the skull. Now, it's not because it looks like a skull. It's because Jewish tradition says that the skull of Adam was buried there. Adam being the first Adam. Jesus being the second Adam. Three o'clock in the afternoon, Wednesday afternoon, he dies. The earth becomes dark. The veil in the temple is rent in two from top to bottom. I believe one of the things that happened when that veil was rent in two is that there was a great discovery that was made that day, and that is that the Ark of the Covenant wasn't in the Holy of Holies. It had been taken away when the kingdom had split earlier, years ago. So I believe that that was revealed to the people, which caused quite a stir. Jesus is then taken suddenly off of the cross. They're in a hurry. They take him to the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, which we studied earlier is actually one of Mary, his mother's kinfolk. So they're taken to what would have been the family tomb. Jesus is laid in there, and a collective hush falls over the followers of Jesus because this is a time of great defeat. The person that they thought was the Messiah, the Chosen One, the Savior, the Christ, has been killed. He could have called 12 legions of angels to his rescue, but he chose not to. Now, we think, when we look at this story, and you even see some churches observe this, we think that, and by the way, I haven't gotten my days mixed up. Jesus was crucified on Wednesday, according to what the Word says. We We've made an error over the years in the fact that he had to be taken down off of the cross because the Sabbath approached, and we have taken that to mean the Saturday Sabbath, when John's gospel is very clear that it was not the Saturday Sabbath, that it was a holy day or high day, meaning a day other than the, than the weekly Sabbath. It was the Feast of Unleavened Bread was the Sabbath that they had to get him down off the cross. The Feast of Unleavened Bread was started at Thursday at 6 o'clock. So he died at 3 o'clock. They had to get him down prepared and into the tomb, which is why things were rushed. So he fulfilled exactly what he said in Matthew 12. You do remember, they asked Jesus for a sign, and he said, "There's only he said a, a wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. The only sign that's going to be given to you is the sign of Jonah the prophet. As Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the belly of the earth three days and three nights. Now, if, if, if you don't mind, if Jesus said he's going to be in the belly of the earth three days and three nights, I'm going to believe what he said over what my calendar said. Is that okay with you? Now, listen, you don't have to change your calendars. And if you want to celebrate Good Friday, that's okay to celebrate Good Friday. At least we're celebrating something. But it was actually Good Wednesday. He was crucified on Wednesday. Fulfilling exactly what he said. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, three days and three nights, and then rose from the grave on Sunday morning. So all of Jerusalem is quiet. His disciples have gone into hiding. 
They don't know what to think. Now, you understand it's not just the 12. There are thousands of people that follow Jesus that are, that are wondering what happened. Word is beginning to spread throughout all of Israel that the one that we thought was the Messiah is dead. They've killed him. And so to them, they are waiting for three days. Now, they don't know that. They don't know that Easter's coming, okay? So they're, 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 they're confused. They're heartbroken. But I want to draw your attention for just a moment with me to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26. And I want to go back here for just a moment in verse 39. Jesus is in the garden. He's, he's taken Peter, James, and John with him to pray. His inner circle, if you will. Matthew 26, 39 says, And he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What, could, could you not watch with me an hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time he went away and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And again he came and found they were asleep again, for their eyes were heavy, so he left them. He went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being portrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise and let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Luke's gospel in Luke chapter 22 brings out something very interesting about this story. And that is, he says that Jesus experienced something called hematohydrosis. Hematohydrosis is when a person is under great stress that the capillaries in their skin rupture and blood begins being mixed with sweat begins to come out of the pores. And that's what Luke says, is that he uh, was sweating great drops of blood. Now, that, that happens with a person that is under tremendous stress. Now, why do you think he was doing, why do you think that happened to him? Now, now I want you to pay very close attention to me here because I don't want you to get the wrong impression. The thing that Jesus had, the events that he knew were in front of him, would have been horrible and would have been difficult for anybody to bear. Knowing that he was going to be scourged. How did he know he was going to be scourged? Because of Isaiah. Isaiah prophesied he was going to be beaten. David prophesied what he was going to look like after he was beaten. David prophesied also that he was going to be crucified, as other places in the Bible also did. So he knew he was going to be beaten. He knew that he was going to be mocked. And he knew that he was going to be crucified, which was a horrible way to die. He knew all of those things. But yet you'll notice here in Matthew chapter 26, actually this event is recorded in all four Gospels. You'll notice here in Matthew 26 and in Luke 22, the thing that Jesus appears to have the problem with, he specified. And he says, he asked the Lord three times, if there is any way that this cup can pass from me. Now, you understand that Jesus was not the first martyr, nor was he the last. There had been many prophets in the Old Testament that had been killed. There had been people in the Old Testament that had been raised from the dead. Elijah and Elisha had both raised people from the dead. As a matter of fact, in 2 Kings, I think it's chapter 13, uh, 
somewhere in there, 1331, somewhere in that area in your Bible. There was a battle that was going on, and, and is, the, the, the army of Israel was fighting a battle, and a young man was killed in the battle, and so they were in retreat, and they didn't have time to give him proper burial, so they just threw him in a tomb. Well, it happened to be the tomb where Elisha was buried. And when that young man who was dead was thrown into that tomb, and he hit the bones of Elisha, there was enough power left in the bones of Elisha that it revived him, and he came back to life, and he got out, and he ran and joined him. That's a powerful anointing, when his dead bones would raise the dead. So, Jesus was not the first person raised from the dead. But the thing that seems to be bothering him is the cup. Now, I've got a whole teaching on this, and you can go back into our archives and find it. The cup that he's talking about, whenever you find the cup referred to in Scripture, it refers to the cup of God's wrath. That is what's bothering him. He, he is, he's realizing now at this time, he is starting to, to have a deeper understanding, a deeper revelation of what exactly is going to happen to him on the cross. It's not that he's going to be hanging on the cross. It's the fact that the wrath of God is going to be poured out on him. And that's what he's, that's what he's asking. If there's any way that we can do this without your wrath coming on me, nevertheless, not my will, but your will. Now, we read over that and we think, well, okay, so God's mad. It's, you know, I mean, is it that big a deal? Oh, my brother and sister. Yeah. While things were quiet in Jerusalem, there was a far greater story that was going on from the time that Jesus was crucified until the time that he was raised from the dead and that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Jesus died, was placed in the tomb, and we find scriptures in Psalm 16, Psalm 139, that tell us that thou will not... It talks about that he was fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, the, the same passage also in Psalm 8 talks about man. But you can tell by reading in Psalm 16 and Psalm 139 that it's talking about somebody else. And it says, you will not leave my soul in hell. For I was created in secret in the bowels of the earth. When as yet none of my members were written in the book. Well, what book's that talking about? What members is it talking about? Other people that died didn't have a book with their members written in it. Jesus does. The Lamb's book of life. So Jesus is crucified. And he goes to hell, to Sheol. Other Old Testament prophets, when they died, they went to Abraham's bosom. That's not where Jesus went. Jesus went to the pit. Because when he was on the cross, do you recall the words that he uttered when he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That is when that came on him. And the experience that he had had his entire life of always feeling the presence of the Father with him was gone. And he was alone. And now the man who had known no sin now has the wrath and the sin of mankind come on him. We cannot imagine what that was like. Ha have any of you ever done, please don't raise your hand, have any of you ever done something that you weren't very proud of? Have you ever done something that you were ashamed of and you go on down the road and you have regret as a matter of fact, if you think about it today, some of those feelings come up again the, uh, of, of regret. Now, now, you've asked for God to forgive you, and He has, 
and He's cleansed you from all unrighteousness, but still sometimes that memory will come up and it puts a pit in your stomach when you think about it. Y'all know what I'm talking about? That ever happened to anybody but me? Don't, don't raise your hand. I know it happened. Okay. Imagine that coming on Jesus to the extent of all of mankind. Not just one event that you and I think about, or maybe two or three, but all of mankind. The guilt, the regret, the shame comes upon Him. The sin that was laid upon Him is not the things that we think are sin. Not stuff. The sin that was laid upon Him was the depravity that came in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve rebelled against God. It was that sin that came upon Jesus. Oh, it would have... It, it, the weight of that... It, it would have changed the way that He looked. And, and as a matter of fact, the Bible says that it did. Matt, the, uh, Isaiah says that when you looked on Him, you couldn't even tell it was a man. And so all of that sin, the depravity of all of mankind, has come upon Jesus. Now, I will say this. The Bible does tell us that for the joy that was set before Him, He endured the cross. The thing that got Him through all of this, the joy that was set before Him was you and me. He looked and saw us. And it's what helped him endure all of this. So he goes to hell. Now I have to ask you this question. And, and Peter preaches this story, this sermon in Acts chapter 2. People think that Jesus may have gone to paradise because he told the thief on the cross, Today will you be with me in paradise. He didn't tell him he'd be with him in heaven. He said, today you will be with me in paradise. Well, the thief went to paradise. Jesus didn't. But paradise could see the pit. We have that story with uh, uh, Lazarus. Not the one that got raised from the dead, but the other one. The rich man in Lazarus. Well, Jesus went to the pit. It makes sense that he went to the pit because he has become sin. Where does sin have to be deposited? It's not going to be deposited in paradise. It has to be deposited in the pit. Now you have to understand what happened. And, I, and I'm if you get an understanding of the events that happened from the cross to the throne, it will change you. Easter's not about the Easter bunny and Easter eggs and candy and those little malt almond robin eggs which I love them Jesus is in the pit and the Bible says that he is tormented he is ridiculed there is great celebration in hell because for 4,000 years the devil has tried to get to this day. He started with Adam and Eve. The ones that had been given authority on the earth. He deceived them. Got the authority of the earth given to him. He then causes Cain to rise up against Abel. And kills his brother. And what he's trying to do is to cut off the bloodlines. And then you find in Genesis chapter 6 that the angels that kept not their first estate cohabited, had sex with women on the earth and produced freaks. He's trying to pollute the bloodline. The flood comes and Noah's delivered. The children of Israel uh, uh, go into captivity in Egypt. They are delivered. God is going to make them a holy nation, a royal priesthood. And then there's the golden calf incident. And that whole nation of priests are reduced to one tribe, the tribe of Levi. And then the enemy comes in, and whenever there's a prophet of God that's raised up to proclaim the wonderful word of God, he brings persecution 
against them. Many of them were killed by the people they were sent to save, to deliver. And you see this pattern that goes on and on. And he looks and he sees this young baby that's a deliverer to deliver Israel. And his parents are instructed to put the baby in a basket and float him down the river. Moses. Devil tried to kill him. Pharaoh ordered children two years old and younger to be killed in Egypt. That's why he was placed in the basket to be protected. And so you find throughout the history of the Old Testament, the devil is looking for the one that was promised in the Garden of Eden. He is looking for that deliverer. He is looking for that Savior. He's looking for the one that's going to bruise his head. And he doesn't know who it is. He's not all-knowing. So anytime somebody closely resembles that, he attacks and tries to kill him and was successful many times. And then he hears of this child that's born in Bethlehem. There's an angelic host that's there singing. Shepherds are, are, are at the scene. He then causes all of the children in the area, two years old and younger, to be killed. You see a pattern? And then, about 30 years later, the plan comes to pass. And he knows that this is the Messiah now. Because after Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, when he came up out of the water, there was a voice that came from heaven that said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And now at this point, it is on. The devil has him marked. He knows now this is the Savior. And we find all through the gospel account. He tempts him. He comes to him and tempts him three times in the wilderness. He, he stirs people up. He goes to preach in his hometown and they try to throw him off a cliff and he just walks through the midst. And he ministers for three years. And then on this particular night, this celebration of this week, he gives himself up freely. And the devil kills him. The devil's plan has succeeded, he thinks. But God had a bigger plan. God knew what was happening. God had this whole thing set. And what happened was, is the devil took Jesus to hell illegally. Have I mentioned to you before that God deals with us according to covenant? And covenants are legal contracts. And the devil takes Jesus to hell. Why? Because he sees the wrath of God poured out upon him. He sees sin poured out on him. But the kicker is, Jesus is without sin. He never sinned. So when the devil sees this happen, he takes him to hell. <clears throat> this is far bigger than the Trojan horse. Jesus is taken to hell illegally. And for three days, the devil and all of his little minions mock him. You, you, we cannot imagine the torment that Jesus went through in hell for those three days. Do you remember in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2, and the earth became without form, and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. In other words, on the earth, the way that we find it in Genesis 1-2, it is in a, a state of chaos. And the Spirit of God is hovering, or, or brooding, the Bible says. He's hovering over the earth. Do you know why he's hovering on the earth? He is waiting the command 
for the Father to give for him to start to work. He's hovering over the earth, and God says, Light be! And the, the Holy Ghost, the power of God, starts moving. And now then, this planet, which is in chaos, starts to begin to be recreated and put back in order. Jesus is in hell, being tormented. All types of unspeakable things are happening to him. And after three days, the Father watching all of this determines that the price has been paid. In full. The Spirit of God is hovering over the situation, just waiting. Just waiting for the word. Waiting for the command. And the Father says, go get him. And the Spirit of God pierces the darkness of hell. Can you imagine what happened in there? I mean, y'all ever been into a house or an apartment before that's kind of been condemned and stuff like that? And you go in and turn the lights on and little roaches go scurrying everywhere when that light's turned on. That's what I like to picture. That's what happened when, when, the, when the power of God came into that place and that light came into hell. Can you imagine? I mean, this is, they, they, they are scurrying. Everybody is getting out of the way. And the Bible tells us over in Philippians that Jesus made a show of him openly. The Spirit of God came in there Jesus walks over to the devil who has the crown on his head as king of the earth. He has Adam's scepter. Jesus goes over there, takes it off of his head, takes the scepter back away from him and comes back to the grave and is standing outside and now people start showing up. And Mary gets there, Mary Magdalene gets there first. And do you remember what Jesus told her? He said, don't touch me. Don't touch me. I have not yet ascended to the Father. One, one gospel says, I have not ascended to my Father and your Father. That's a powerful statement right there. Now, why did he need to do that? Why was this so important? Well, Hebrews chapter 9 gives us a play-by-play -play as to what's going on. You ought to read that. You ought to start in chapter 12, I mean, chapter 9, verse 12, and read through the end of the chapter. Because it talks about that Jesus goes to the Holy of Holies in heaven. And you have to be careful in the King James because it said, and he went to where the copies were. That word copies doesn't mean copy. That word copy there is actually a Greek word that means pattern. So the Holy of Holies in heaven are the utensils that the other Holy of Holy is patterned after. It, it's the standard. It's the pattern. The copies are made in the tabernacle that was in the wilderness and the temple that was in Jerusalem. And the Bible says that he entered in one time and he sprinkled his blood. He cleansed the Holy of Holies in heaven. My brother and sister, do you realize how far this sin reached. The sin of mankind, the sin of Adam, reached everywhere up to, but not including, the very throne of God. It affected heaven. And Jesus ascends and takes His blood and places it on the mercy seat in heaven. The price now has been completely, entirely, fully, wholly paid for man's sin that came in with Adam. Now man has a way, a means, by which to be reunited with God. What an awesome, awesome time. What an awesome story. Now Colossians chapter 1 and verse 17 there are many scriptures that talk about this through the Bible. Powerful scriptures. 
The Bible tells us that in, in, in 1 Timothy 3.16 that God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit. Now, I, I want to share something with you. If, if God was justified, then you realize in order to be justified, that means there was a time you were not justified. Now, we get confused sometimes with Bible definitions of spiritual words like justification, sanctification, glorification, all those other cations. Justification, very simply, is delivered from the penalty of sin. Sanctification is delivered from the power of sin. And glorification is delivered from the presence of sin. So when the Bible talks about, and Jesus was glorified, that means he is delivered from the very presence of sin. By the way, the Bible says that a believer can also experience that. But if you know, this is a, this is a progression. You first have to be justified before you can be sanctified, before you can be glorified. It's a process. And the first one is justification, which we would call the new birth. Now, something's very interesting about Colossians 1.17. As a matter of fact, I think I want you to take a look at this particular verse of Scripture. Colossians 1.17. It has insight into a particular thing. It says, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. He is the head of the body, which is the church, who is the beginning. Uh, right, am I getting this right? Is the beginning. The firstborn from the dead. That in all things he may have the preeminence. Now, I want you to notice that. Now, is this in your Bible? I mean, make sure I'm quoting this right, okay? It, it says in your Bible, doesn't it, that he's the firstborn from the dead. Does your Bible say that? Now, I mentioned to you earlier in this story that Jesus was not the first person raised from the dead. Right? We, we have examples in our Old Testament. Matter of fact, we have uh, many people in the Old Testament that were raised from the dead. This wasn't the first time this had happened, but the experience of Jesus being raised from the dead is unique. And that is, he was the first person that was born from spiritual death. Now, I understand that that statement shakes a whole lot of people. There are churches and denominations that blast, that, that actually think that that is a, a doctrine of Jesus dying spiritually, and they attack it. Can I just word something very simply for you here for just a moment for you to ponder? If Jesus did not die spiritually, then you're going to have to. If he didn't die spiritually, then you're going to have to pay the price yourself, and you can't. So there's no hope. So all this stuff about going to heaven and eternal life, we can't do it. But that's not what happened. Jesus became, and, and there, there's something about they have a problem with, it's impossible for God to die. Well, the Father didn't die, and the Holy Ghost didn't die. The person that died was the God-man. The part of the Godhead that is man and God. He was the only, do you understand, that's the only way this could happen. The only way that this sacrifice could, could have been made is for man and God to both come together as covenant partners. Well, they came together in one person, Jesus. And His blood was shed for man, and His blood was shed for God. And He ratified the covenant with that blood, the covenant that was made with Abraham. So unlike the others, Jesus was spiritually dead. I mean, why else would it talk about He's the firstborn? He was the first one to do this. 
He was born from spiritual death to spiritual life. The first Adam got that in reverse. He went from spiritual life to spiritual death. Remember that spiritual death does not mean that you are separated or that you are uh, cease to exist. Spiritual death means to be separated from God. And didn't Jesus say that? It's what he said on the cross. So separation from God is spiritual death. Was Jesus separated from God? Yes. Did Jesus die spiritually? Yes. That's what 1 Timothy's talking to you about. That's what Colossians 1, 17 and 18 are talking about. And it's also talked about in the book of Hebrews. I have good news. Romans tells us that by one man, sin entered into the world. You didn't, you didn't sin in the garden, did you? You didn't cause that stuff to come into you. What did you do to cause sin to come into your life? Nothing. It's like a virus that came in in the Garden of Eden, and that virus is passed down through blood to every human being that's born on the planet. The cure is to have different blood. And that is to allow the blood of Jesus to eradicate that virus, sin, out of your life. He's the antidote. By one man, sin entered into the world. And by one man, salvation came into the world. One man caused it to come in. One man paid the price that eradicated it for us. And you and I, because of that sacrifice that was made, you and I, because of what happened from the cross to the throne, can have eternal life with God. Amen? Now that's good preaching right there. That's enough to get happy feet about. Now I'd like for you to bow your heads with me, please. Father, we thank you so much for the sacrifice that the Lord Jesus paid for us. There may be some in this place today, and there may be some of you listening, that you've never, ever accepted this price, this act of love, personally, for yourselves. That you've never, ever made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. Well, I can think of no better day to experience that glorious event than on the day that we celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. So if there's any of you in here today or any of you listening that you've never ever made Jesus Christ Lord of your life and you would like to do that, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm just simply going to ask you to slip your hand up so that I can see it and, and you acknowledge it. Nobody looking around, every head bowed, every eye closed. Anybody in this place, you've never made Jesus Lord of your life, and today, you desire forgiveness of your sins. You desire to make Jesus the Lord of your life and experience eternal life. Would you please raise your hand? Anybody at all? I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. Thank you. Thank you, I see that hand. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else? I see that hand. You can put it down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You may put it, you may put your hand up. I want to ask you one other question. You would say, Pastor, I've I've made Jesus Lord of my life. But I've slipped away from those things and that, that love that was once in my heart. I, I've, I've gotten away from it. And I desire so much to come back to my Father's arms. I desire for things 
to be reestablished in my life with God. Like the prodigal son, I, I want to return home. If that's anybody in here, would you please raise your hand? Just up real quick and down. I see that hand. I'm put your hand there. Anybody else? I see that hand. Put that, I see that hand. You may put it down. Anybody else? I see that hand. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Looking around one more time. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Hallelujah. Well, I, I shared with you that I, I wasn't going to embarrass you. But I do want to pray with you. And so those of you that are around, I would like for you to help those that raise their hand by simply repeating this prayer after me. I am going to pray, and you repeat after me. Father, I thank you so much for your love that you've extended to me. I thank you that you gave your only son to live and to die for me. Well, Father, I accept that sacrifice. And I come before you today asking in that holy name of Jesus to forgive my sins. I confess that I am a sinner, that I am lost without you. But I don't desire that. I desire to acknowledge today that Jesus Christ is Lord of my life. Father, I thank you for it. I receive your goodness and your grace in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. You may look up at me. Glorious day for you. You're going to look back on Easter of 2022 as the day that you accepted Jesus Christ as Lord of your life. Be easy to remember. Amen. Well, thank you very much for coming out today and being a part of our service. Thank you for joining us. My desire for you is that God's richest and best are yours. And remember, there is victory in Jesus. Amen. As I tithe and give offerings, I'm believing the Lord for vision and direction, jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefits, sales and commissions, favorable settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, discounts and dividends, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, bills decreased, blessings and increased. Thank you, Lord, for meeting all my financial needs that I may have more than enough to give into the kingdom of God and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you agree with that, please say amen. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. And I want you to notice there in verse 26 that one of the things that we do when we partake of communion is we're looking back on what Jesus did for us we're looking back on the sacrifice that we've talked about this morning in the resurrection but it says also until he comes so we're looking forward to his return also so in doing this we're acknowledging before heaven and earth that we believe that the son of god is returning to the earth so he says do this remember this therefore whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, not his brother or his neighbor. Let a person examine themselves. So let him eat of his bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner 
eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. Now that word sleep is a euphemism for dying prematurely. This is the only place given in the New Testament that gives a reason for a Christian to be sick or to die early. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. So when you judge yourself, then there's no need for others or for God to judge you if you judge yourself. Now, you have two elements here. One is the bread or cracker, wafer, that represents the body of the Lord Jesus. So we were just instructed there to examine ourselves. So, let's examine ourselves where our body is concerned. Now, don't, don't eat the cracker yet, okay? So, everybody bow your head, close your eyes, just for you to concentrate and to focus. And I'd like for you to repeat after me. Father, I thank you that the Lord Jesus himself bore stripes on his back so that I can walk in health. For by those stripes, I am healed. I examine myself now. Any symptom of sickness, disease, infirmity in my body, right now, I judge it in Jesus' name. I command it to cease and desist to bow its knee to the mighty name of, the Je- of Jesus, because by His stripes, I am healed. Amen. You know the Bible, don't, don't take it yet. We're going to do, do them together, because what happens, you take the cracker, then you sit there and wait while we're talking about, and you, so we're going to do them together. You know the Bible tells us over in the book of Psalms that when the children of Israel were delivered out of Egypt, that after they had had the Passover meal, which is kind of what we're celebrating, we're, con- we're celebrating what they were looking forward to. That there was not one weakly or sickly one among them. That's pretty good. Okay. Now then we're going to do the same thing where the cup is concerned. And I'll tell you when to eat and to drink. Okay. Let's bow our heads again. Father, we thank you for the blood of the Lord Jesus. Which was shed for the remission of our sin. I thank you that this blood cleanses me from all unrighteousness. It cleanses me from all sin. Father, I examine myself now of any sin in my life, of any unforgiveness, any offense that I would have towards someone else. I ask that you forgive me, and I receive my forgiveness. I receive my cleansing from unrighteousness. In the mighty name of the Lord Jesus, amen. Now we're going to partake of the wafer and then the juice. And then the juice.